music. Okay, so let's get uh, started. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to welcome to the World Economic Forum annual meeting, 2018. Um, welcome to, uh, to 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 the room here, and congratulations. Uh, well done, everybody, for getting here. Uh, I know it hasn't been easy. I think the fact that you are all here is testament already to your uh, resilience and uh, courage and uh, lots of other great, uh, great, great attributes. Um, so uh, we're going to um, uh, start off with a great uh, discussion uh, here in a second. I just wanted to very quickly contextualize it a little. My name is Derek O'Halloran. Um, I am uh, with the World Economic Forum. I run one of our 14 system initiatives. Um, which are platforms to create impact uh, in the world. And this, uh, we're going to hear today some examples of some great partnership and impact um, that is ongoing. Uh, this is part of this broader initiative um, that uh, we'll hear a little about, um, but we certainly encourage all of you to come and learn more about and be part of uh, uh, as we go along. Um, you know, this week we're talking about creating shared futures in a fractured world. I don't think uh, anywhere this was more relevant, more pertinent than in this topic here. Um, digital economy and society can feel like a very big, big and broad topic, however. So what is it we're trying to achieve? It's very clear in some other areas like uh, environment, we have targets, or food security, we know what good looks like. And so with digital economy and society, we've identified six key shared outcomes that we are uh, encouraging partnership and collaboration around. And these are things that may not be exhaustive, but we things, they're things that we know we have to get right if we want to create a digital future that is sustainable, inclusive, and trustworthy. And so just very quickly to, to give you that frame before handing over to our excellent uh, panel here, the things we know we need to get right. Number one, we need to pr people need to have access to the internet, and it needs to be accessible to them. Secondly, we need to help organizations go through a responsible business transformation at a scale and speed that's never been seen before. Third, we need fit for purpose, and we need informed policy making. The, games, the game is changing, and the rules need to change, and the way we make rules need to change. Fourth, we need security and resilience baked into organizations and practices and people. Fifth, we need to have robust and open and inclusive uh, identity and access systems. If the future is digital, and we want to be inclusive, well, then everybody needs to be able to access the services in an appropriate way. And finally, so many of the opportunities that we talk about in the fourth industrial revolution are based on the idea of sharing data and sharing information. But this is what we all know highly problematic today. So finding ways to enjoy the benefits of sharing data while protecting privacy, security, transparency, and other values is, is the other key outcome. So with that, um, that's at a very high level. We're going to have a great discussion here from the people who are actually leading work and initiatives on this and some related areas like employment and skills. I'm going to hand it over to uh, our moderator par excellence, Lynn Sanamour, uh, <laughs> and I uh, hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Derek. I'm just going to do a very quick introduction <coughs> to the panelists here. Um, we don't want to take an awful lot of time because we have a lot of ground to cover in the very short hour. We have Michael Gregoire, who's sitting directly across from me, who's the CEO of CA Technologies, and he's also the incoming chair of the IT Governors Community. We have Neely Crows, who's a former EU commissioner and uh, former Open Data Institute board member, and also is leading the Future Agenda Council here on innovation and entrepreneurship at the forum. We have Chuck Robbins, who's the CEO of um, Cisco and is the outgoing uh, IT Governors chair. And to my right is Gavin Patterson, who's the CEO of the BT Group, and he is the chair of the telecom governors community. And to my left is Jim Smith, um, who uh, is the, the um, president and CEO of Thomson Reuters. He also is the co-chair with me of the forum's digital economy and society initiative here. So we'll dispense with further introductions later. And I think, as, as Derek said, uh, obviously the WEF theme here is creating a shared future in a fractured world. Um, this particular session objective is to actually share the impact agenda for uh, the World Economic Forum, focusing on the activities of the past year, but looking forward to 2018 and trying to identify those um, small number of areas that are the most important and most importantly is work that the, the forum can actually do to help drive significant sustainable change um, in the industry. So um, what we'd actually like the panelists to address here today 
is to talk about how will industries, innovation, and institutions shape the future of the digital economy. So I'd actually like to start um, with Chuck as the outgoing chair of the um, IT governors community, and specifically um, ask you what's the top issue that's on your mind and that's keeping you up. And then, Mike, I will come to you as well as the incoming chair, again, of the um, IT governors community here at the forum. So Chuck? Yeah, well, thank you, Lynn. And, uh... Mike, looking forward to uh, passing it off to you today. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that Still sincerely. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, this is an incredibly important topic, and there are, <clears throat> I think, we all know there are f phenomenal positive impacts from this move to digital in the economy. And then I think there's a huge number of responsibilities that actually fall back on, in, in my view, the business community. Uh, and, uh, and the institutions that we all represent. And I think that just a few of them, and then we can dig into more of them more effectively, I think it is, it is our responsibility to try to uh, optimize access to, uh, to the benefit and of the digital economy. And I think that that's through extending broadband, extending education, healthcare, and everything into the, you know, the remote areas of the world, which we've all been focused on for many years. Um, the second I think is really important is embracing new sets of partnerships. I think this is going to really be key for us. Uh, and I think that includes sometimes competitors actually partnering together to, to actually help bring some of the benefit of technology to society and or help solve some of the challenges that some of the technology may actually present. Uh, and those are public-private partnerships, competitive partnerships, just completely foreign types of partnerships. Um, and then I think the, uh, the third is really uh, dealing with this issue of security and trust. And that includes privacy, it include, includes cross-border border manage, cross data management uh, and many other issues. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is ensuring that we're providing all of those people around the world with the opportunity to gain the skills needed to actually operate in this new world. So those are some of the top of mind thoughts for me as we move into this discussion. Thank you. Well, two years ago when Chuck took over and I was on the committee, one of the things that he did that I thought was, was leading is he said, I don't want to just produce content. We have to put something tangible in place. And the biggest problem we had or the biggest problem we all agreed on was this disassociation between the people who understand technology and the people who don't. And he couldn't have been more right, because if you fast forward just two years later, you know, this is absolutely positively top of mind. So we need to change the narrative of tech. You know, just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. So forcing that conversation in place, and then us as tech providers, leaning into the problem and helping people who are disassociated with tech get the skills so they can participate in it. So you go from, I don't play golf, to I'm a struggling golfer. Um, we need to find a way to get people into tech where they just don't disassociate or self-select out because they find it's too hard or it's too expensive or they don't feel like they have an opportunity. So what we're trying to do is get uh, a consortium of companies that have content together and we're not targeting the K through 12, although that's incredibly important. We're targeting people who've been working for about five years that tech is starting to in, you know, get in the way of them earning a living. Now, the data on this is getting pretty astounding. Uh, it just came out last Friday, there's gonna be 6.6 .6 million jobs dissociated over the next 10 years. The thing that shocked me, though, is how little blue collar workers as a percentage are getting disassociated. That's already happened. There's going to be 4 million typical white collar office workers that are not necessarily digitally astute that are going to be replaced by technology. I think if we don't get in front of that, and those are only US numbers, I don't, if we don't get in front of that and help these people be part of a productive uh, working environment, I think that there's going to be a lot of social unrest. Yeah, and some very interesting points and some very, I think, um, sobering bring ones as well. I'd like to move next to Gavin. Uh, the, you're the chair of the telecom governance community, which of course represents the telecommunications industry and some of the world's largest players in, in driving and developing infrastructure development for the digital economy. So what are their biggest concerns or issues that you see for the coming <coughs> year? 
Um, well, you, you won't be surprised that some of the themes that uh, Mike and Chuck have, have mentioned already are, are front of mind for, for us. Um, so there are probably three in particular I'd call out. Um, firstly, the case for investment. Um, there's a huge investment required around the world um, you know, of the order of $10 trillion uh, over the next um, 10 years. Uh, and the, the case is there. There's no question about the opportunities that it is going to, to, to create uh, for people. But ensuring that there's a framework um, that makes the investment make sense, it's able to attract private uh, capital, uh, and that uh, the people putting that capital to work are able to make a fair return. So the, the, the opportunities around 5G, around 5 to the home, IoT, uh, are pretty endless, I think, at the moment. But making the business case work is, is something that we, we've, we've struggled with. I think, secondly, uh, this theme around cyber um, affects everyone. It's not just people in the tech space. You know, it's, it's a top three risk, I think, uh, uh, on a, virtually every board and every CEO I talk to. Uh, and the sophistication of attack is just getting um, more and more um, uh, difficult to, to combat. Uh, and the, the, I think the only way forward is through collaboration. I mean, the, the comments that uh, um, both Mike and Chuck made around partnership, sharing best practice, sharing data, it's absolutely critical in a world where we're under increasing threat uh, and in, you know, if I look at our own network, um, we get a, a, a tempted cyber attack once every second uh, at the moment. Um, so it gives you some sense of the, the, the challenge we face. And I think the third issue is around skills. Um, there is a, you know, there's a real shortage of, 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 uh, of tech skills um, around the world. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, we're not producing enough students, apprentices, graduates that uh, want to go into tech. Um, and more broadly, we believe certainly that tech is going to be part of everybody's job going forward. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that it's part of the curriculum in the way that reading and writing and arithmetic have, have always been. Um, because without it, you know, we're not going to be able to realize the opportunities that uh, lie ahead of us. So I think there are many common themes, and it will be good to work together, gentlemen. <laughs> There's such a large percentage of the world that still doesn't have access to the internet. And then of those that do, of course, have either inferior access to the internet or very expensive. And when we talk about trying to close some of the other digital divides that exist in the world, this is obviously such a, such a critical, critical space. And, and a lot of the efforts, such as whether it's investment, infrastructure investment, or skilling, really needs to very quickly roll out to those other parts of the world, or we're yeah. just accentuating the current set of divides in, in the world, which I'm sure is well known to everybody here on the panel. If I could turn now to um, Jim Smith. Jim and I, as I said earlier, are co-chairs of the Forums Initiative here on the Digital Economy and Society. So I'd like to ask Jim what uh, are the top issues that he thinks um, the, the Forum should be addressing <laughs> and is on the mind of the, uh, the Stewardship Board. Yeah, well, thanks, Lane. It's, I think it's been fascinating over the last, I think, four years at Davos to come and see um, the recognition, um, particularly in the industry groups. And we've heard from three uh, 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 industry leaders here in the, in the tech industry uh, about the recognition of the d digital revolution. And then the, a year later, there's, wow, this could be profound. And then it was like the next, within three years, it went to, Oh my God! How are we going to react to it? Our, our, it's going to change our, our business models, the competitive landscape, everything. And I think every single um, industry vertical uh, uh, and, and every uh, 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 working group here related to business uh, has a stream on digital disruption and how it's going to disrupt their industry. And you know, we're, we we live in a world now where seven of the ten most valuable companies in the world are tech companies. Yet at the same time, we're seeing a growing tech backlash, in fact, as people are concerned about what this technology revolution is likely to do to their employability. Yeah. Um, as, as we see them worry about what it's going to do to their privacy. Um, as we see people worried um, about 
what it's done to the trusted sources of news that they've relied upon and the information that they consume every day. How reliable is that now? And I think we've also seen um, that, that in a world where so much fracture is driven by the economic divide between the haves and haves nots, we now have a tool that could be very powerful but also could exacerbate that divide between those who have access to the new world and those who don't. So I think what we're trying to do through the systems initiatives, and, and Derek did a very good job of outlining the very six themes, but it's to organize a public-private dialogue uh, around these various issues. And I think the, some of the things I'm most excited about in the coming year would be an extension of the, uh, of the Access for All uh, initiative that we've seen have some really promising results in places like Rwanda and, and, other, and other places around the world. Um, I think we're going to be doing a lot of work around this issue of digital identity because mm -hmm. digital identity is foundational to so much uh, of the dialogue around access, uh, uh, around authentication, around trust, uh, and around privacy as well. Um, and I think this notion of, of cyber, uh, the forum opened a cybersecurity center last year. It's, as Gavin said, it's uh, absolutely top uh, right quadrant for every CEO in the world, and I think becoming top right quadrant for everybody's worry about their personal data as well. Um, so I think there are a number of very interesting initiatives, and I, I, I think they'll, with digital identity as a, as, as a building block, um, I, I think the tough thing we'll try to balance, and I think we'll dive pretty deeply into that, that, that tough bit between um, uh, trusted access to the internet um, and, 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 and the protection of privacy at the same time. And it's going to be a very difficult balancing act, and I would hope that the forum would be a, a good place to have that public-private dialogue, because we are also seeing, in addition to a public backlash, uh, the beginnings of a pretty fractured regulatory backlash <laughs> with everyone trying to attack it, attack it their own way. And I think one thing Lynn and I have spoken about a great deal in this initiative is um, let's, let's, let, let's operate on the first do no harm uh, initiative here, uh, and that particularly when it comes to regulation. Thank, thank you, Jim. That's very, very interesting. Good segue. So what? So that's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am going to, to segue to um, Neely in a moment, but I also want to give everybody here in the room um, a heads up that we will actually turn to the floor um, shortly. And we're not looking for statements from the floor. We're really looking for quest um, answers to the question of what are the, the main challenges or opportunities you see that could affect the shape of the digital economy in the coming year. So if you could prepare some concise, brief questions, um, then we will take a number of those, and then we'll come back to the panelists again to respond to those or to continue some of the, these um, elements forward. So Neely, you're a former EU commissioner. For many years, you were actually at the heart of so much of the, the digital activities here um, in, in Europe. And of course, in your current um, role as the uh, Global Agenda Council for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, um, I wonder if you could actually comment from those two perspectives, and as we said, it's a nice segue to Jim's um, last comment with respect to uh, regulation as well. And thank you, Lynn. When I was preparing for the questions uh, we got uh, from the organizers, I was thinking of a moment six years ago, or nearby six years ago, uh, still in Brussels, um, I do have two granddaughters, uh, U.S. citizens, living in San Francisco, and the youngest at that time, very young. Um, we were Skyping, and she was asking at a certain moment, uh, nay, nay, by the way, what is your age? Six years ago, so then you can just count. <laughs> um, and I said, I'm 70. And she said, and you are still alive? <laughs> so just to put it in a way that it is ageless uh, what we are doing. And every time, and I was thinking of that um, with some of the interventions before, it's a turning point, but every year we are saying, now it's a turning point. Now we have to act, and now we have to bridge, and so on. What I'm um, aware of, and with a lot of uh, opportunities, but also with new activities at the moment, involved in a refugee camp in Jordania, uh, involved in youth cancer, uh, organizing uh, new hospitals and so on. 
It's all about the digital technology and it's opening the world, so to say. So for me, it is number one, overcoming indeed the societal resistance, for you have to explain to the refugee, to the, the one you are asking money for, to uh, the cancer uh, patient, to the parents, and you have to explain what it's all about, what is uh, to digital skills and lifelong learning. By the way, for me, there is in everyone talent. Um, whatever your location is in Africa or whatever, there is talent, but you have to just push the right button and you have to give the right opportunities. So the digital dividing and uh, the, the, uh, the diversity that we are sometimes missing, for me, is a high priority. With diversity, and we were discussing that earlier on, uh, we are just touching upon a number of people, millions and millions of people, uh, talking about women, and um, we, we can just use them and give them opportunities and so on. But also talking about, and then I'm touching upon, Lynn, uh, the data flows, adopting and adapting cross-border flows, for that is at stake. And I don't pretend that in Europe we have done that enough. We are still acting, there are still borders, and the European Union, the single market should be borderless, but there are still borders for whatever reason, for national uh, reasons or whatever. But with the uh, adapting cross-border uh, data flows to new data, uh, localization policies is the uh, moment where we have to realize that's not a threat, that is an opportunity, that's a challenge, so to say. But you need trust, you need flexible governments, and that is what is also at stake, talking about regulation. Regulation, per definition, is looking at the past. Uh, what type of authority you are talking of, it is talking about your experience of the past, and at that time, cartels and so on, so you have to regulate. Having uh, put that at stake, this is not at stake anymore. It's going too quickly, so, and there I'm just addressing all of you, the business world, the institutions, you have to be active in just formulating your own regulation for your own company, so to say. And that that is, of course, easy for me to say, but it is also in your advantage for then talking about trust, talking about opportunity, that makes uh, a lot of sense. And strengthening trust in technology uh, through the algorithm uh, transparency. It's all about transparency. People are willing to trust, but they need to know what's behind it and what is done by it. And there, when I'm allowed to make one sentence of my worry, I think that in the whole discussion, and perhaps that could be taken for next year, one of the issues for the World Economic Forum, talking about the social media and talking about the younger generation and the real young, the child, when we are looking and when we are listening to those explanations of the former uh, Facebook uh, members of the board and of those who are saying, Whatever the reason for that statement is, that's not at stake now, but that it is not without risk. And when Tim Cook, for example, just this week was mentioning that if he would have a child, he would never give the child permission to go on the social media. And I think that that is just a push for us to think what is the risk at a certain moment for the younger generation. And of course, I'm not saying you should skip all the social media, whatever, that, that's nonsense. But at the moment when you are looking at figures, how much of the time a child, for example, is spending to iPads, uh, mobile phones, and so on, that's not a healthy issue. And of course, there are examples where people, where children got blind because they were too often, too long looking at the screen. But even taking that aside, it's worth enough, but we have a responsibility. And then I'm addressing uh, the business world and the institutions and not waiting for governments, for governments, politicians are waiting till there 
the need or till there is a positive advantage for the next election to get back in their office, and that sounds very negative. But, well, I'm a former politician, so I pretend to know what is at stake. But we have to take our responsibility, and it can be fun too, for competitive issues are at stake there too. If a uh, business is well aware that this is one of the possibilities, uh, and BT in the past did part of those talking about privacy and talking about youth, uh, then of course it's difficult. You have to communicate, but at the end of the day, you are making a lot of positive sense. Well, some very, very provocative points there, very interesting. Um, I've spent nearly two decades, in fact, sort of two decades just about now on internet governance matters and certainly of access as well. And so we've always relied on a lot of those on what is probably called soft policy. It's norms and principles as a start, so you can find some common ground. Soft policy can become regulation um, appropriately in time. So that would be an interesting topic to perhaps pick up on. We've also heard about um, access and skills and training as well. So I'll just put those as, as sort of markers for the moment. And then if we can, go to um, the floor here for, again, um, a couple of questions. And then we'll bring those back in and, and do one final round with the panelists. So I apologize for my back to you, but I don't have a belt on, so I can't have this clipped to me. Could you please identify yourself and your organization? Uh, my name is Rajesh uh, from Mukund in India. Uh, just a question. When you meet two years from now, uh, and all of you as leaders, we've uh, talked about the issues of access, digital divide, and economic divide, and trust. What do you think will be the three or four specific things you think you will have achieved, or we will have achieved, uh, for addressing this, which would have made a difference? Mm. Very good question. Thank you. Um, want me to take a shot at it, or are you, or are you collecting uh, questions? I'm going to collect um, okay. three or four questions, I think, and then we'll we'll come back around, sir. Uh, I'm a board member of the Iranian Group, uh, and also directly by Chancellor for Research at the University of Technology. One of the questions that we didn't look at is the growing power of platforms in two-sided markets. There is a perception that these platforms are gaining value based on the data that consumers are providing. Yes, they're getting better service, but they're not sharing in the value that is being created. Should the challenge for the world be that we look at transparent mechanisms by which people whose data, are being, data is being used, they actually benefit in an open and transparent way using technology like micropayment and blockchain to ensure in a transparent way. I think that's one of the biggest And interesting, many of the components that actually could support that exist today, but they haven't come together holistically or in a way that actually facilitates ease by individuals. You have the floor. Yeah. Uh, my name is Yasser al from Sabic. So my question is, what are the limitations of the current structural systems that, if you just mentioned that, within two years we can achieve what you have said? Okay, thank you. Let's just see if there's any other questions here. So, Martin McCarr from CA Technologies. <laughs> thank you, Martin McCarr from CA Technologies. My question is around the impact on technology and digital disruption in the labor intensive markets. Uh, particularly, for example, in Asia Pacific, where a lot of the economies have depended on high labor industries, which undoubtedly will be disrupted by artificial intelligence and automation. Mm -hmm. Another very good question. See if there's one more in the back of the room here, and then we'll come back to the panelists. Hi, I'm Saad. Part of the Global Shippers community of the forum, representing uh, Pakistan. Uh, so one of my questions is really about knowing how the economy in emerging, the digital economy in uh, emerging economies will shift. Like they're already trying to catch up with the third industrial revolution. How will they leapfrog that to move to the fourth industrial revolution and what the strategy for that will look like? Thank you. I don't see any other requests for the floor. Okay. 
and then we'll we'll come back to the panelists. And... Uh, my name is Nikolai Nikiforov. I'm the Minister of Telecom and Mass Communications of Russia. Uh, and since our our panel is mostly represented by industry leaders, my question is about the your your vision of the government strategy because governments compete with each other. Well, it's it's a kind of a good type of competition. They compete about quality of life, investment climate, <coughs> enhancing infrastructure development, regulatory environment. But what should governments really do to win this digital race? How to uh, be how to, how to keep the necessary speed in order to, to be a part of this digital race? What, 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 what is your piece of advice for the governments? Thank you. Maybe I'll come back and um, I think, Chuck, you were actually quite keen to answer the very first question. On, um, so maybe we can talk about that a little bit, which again was what are the first, um, what are the three or four things that we came back in two years um, that we believe these set of activities would have addressed? But also if you want to weigh in on one of the other um, subsequent questions okay. as well. Well, I thought that, uh, you know, Jim, you made a great point. If you go back four years coming here, we were talking about the Internet of Things and then the fourth industrial revolution and then every, it, we quickly moved to nobody's denying it's real and now all of a sudden what are the implications and the challenges associated with it. And I think it's been fascinating to watch the pace at which that's occurred. And I think, look, I don't worry at all about whether businesses or even countries or cities will figure out how to embrace the technology to drive productivity, to enhance the way they operate, to hopefully deal with traffic issues. Um, we need connected snow plows, I think this morning. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think the, um, I really believe that the mandate for us uh, going forward, which leads to what I think we need to set as an aspiration two years from now, is that we, we as tech leaders and business leaders have to actually step up and get in the middle of these issues. And we can't, we can't wait for government or someone else to solve these issues because um, it's, you know, whether it's working on uh, providing educational access, because every job on the planet at some point in the future, we could debate how far out, is going to be a technology job of some sort. So providing the skills is going to be, it's going to be critical. And so if we could wait or, you know, what we've been working on the last couple of years, which is simply a very small platform that's actually the beginning. And I think that what that represents, two things. Number one is creating assessment and skills capabilities or access to them for some number of individuals around the world. But perhaps the more important thing that it demonstrates was a number of companies who actually compete with each other, who put that aside mm -hmm. to bring our content together to actually help get at this problem, which I think is going to be a fundamental thing that we have to do going forward. And whether it's, um, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, and we had a, uh, we had a meeting in Silicon Valley just uh, about three weeks ago with 24 of the largest companies in tech. And we haven't, announced anything yet, but I'll tell you that we, we got together and it was CEOs of these companies and we were talking about how do we bring our ability to innovate and, and our cash and our power, our strength and everything else to actually, even in our, in our community, to start solving issues like homelessness, affordable housing, hunger, and all the things that occur. Because we, we actually have the ability and we have an unbelievable desire to innovate. And if we apply that curiosity and those skills against some of these problems, I think we can do some amazing things. The final comment I'll make is connected back a little bit to the government side of it. Um, some of these issues have to be more clearly either understood or um, more pragmatically understood to actually get the right policy in place because what happens is, and we all know this is ideology takes over and we end up going from one extreme to another on some sort of policy where the actual in the middle is somewhere where we need to land but we bounce back and forth depending on which party is actually making the decision and we don't actually get to the right policy that in, that encourages investment and encourages you know that actually helps us solve these problems so I think there's a lot of things that we have to do and I think you know my top messages are that the business leaders have to step up get involved 
And we have to put competition aside and we got to work very closely with government entities around the world to solve these problems. You would also say that given the situation that you just described in the latter part of your comments, that certainly there's a role for citizens as well um, in terms of maybe smooth, maybe smoothing out some of those um, you know, whipsaws back and forth between the ideological views. And, and second, there's an expectation from many of the world that they have a greater voice and that they're more deeply engaged much earlier in a lot of these discussions. But that's not easy to do, as, as we all know. Um, it's one of the things I find kind of interesting, which is what are the efforts that both industry's doing plus policymakers are doing to actually engage the civil society voice, the individual voice in a lot of these discussions. Because I think, obviously, it's critical at a very fundamental level. I also think it's, it could be very useful in terms of smoothing out some of the um, whipsaws we're seeing if we could find a way to more deeply and properly engage them. Um, let me go next to... Would you mind if I add one no, remark please. to that? I couldn't agree more, but quite often you can feel and see uh, that there is a, um, a gap between uh, the policymakers and uh, the industry and uh, the people. And policymakers pretend to be for the, the representative of the people, but sometimes you don't recognize it, to put it in a diplomatic way. Having said that, I think that every citizen has the responsibility, but also has the challenge to influence, to work with policymakers. So you don't need to be a policymaker to have your influence. And it's not only talking about industry, but as a citizen, you can just, with a team of people where you have discussed certain issues, you can go to your representative or you can go to your uh, government member and get in touch with real life for them. No, that's a very good point as well. Is there any other panelist who wants to come in on that, or should we go to a, a new topic? Maybe we can come to, if I look through some of the, the questions we had, um, and there were questions on kind of the impact of technology, labor, um, leapfrogging, um, those sorts of things. Um, we could either come back to the skills um, we were talking about earlier. We could certainly come back to some of the other work that's occurring in the economy and society. Um, I'll, I'll comment Kevin. on the, the skills agenda because of all the points we talked about this morning, the one that worries me most is, is skills. Um, I think the transformation going through the, the job market at all levels, at entry level, retraining halfway through your career, uh, the extension of your working uh, life. You know, this is the, the, the biggest challenge I think uh, we all face. Uh, and uh, as leaders, if we don't work together to get it right, the backlash that we've talked about and Jim referred to in his comments in particular, I think will get worse, not better. Um, the opportunities that tech and the internet in general uh, offer is a, a huge. Um, there's no question about that, but it will mean that everybody's job is going to have a tech element to it. And at the moment, very, very few people train in tech. And there are a lot of very capable people who are turned off it in, in, through the education system, um, uh, even though they have the, the raw intelligence, and the raw uh, processing power and um, computational thinking that would, would make them very good at tech-related jobs. Uh, but somehow we've got to make it a broad church that is that people recognize it's part of everybody's job now rather than simply programs to one side. Uh, I think we need to, within that, particularly look at the gender uh, bias that is inherent um, and is, is limiting the, the, the potential that we're realizing here. And also building in a natural bias into the way we're, we're solving some of these problems because we're not getting enough diverse thinking into it. Uh, and then I think as people go through their careers, you know, the thought that you can have, you know, you train in one job and you live in, you stay in that job for 50 years is clearly uh, not the case anymore. But as yet, we're not seeing enough of people taking lifelong learning and, 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 and taking on their own responsibility, supported by government and their employers to retrain and keep their skills relevant um, so that they can adapt as the job market changes. You know, we're not seeing that become the norm. And this, this is fundamentally, I think, the biggest challenge we face. We'll solve the investment challenge. You know, we've got to work together to solve the, the cyber threat that I've mentioned, but it's the skills agenda and, 
and how that's going to change very, very rapidly and could ultimately mean that the parts of society that are completely excluded um, uh, uh, that we've, we've really got to, to be on the front foot for, I think. No, it's not only for filling jobs, by the way. <coughs> it's far broader. Hmm. It's for just a challenge for everybody. Hmm. No, that's a very good point. Um, otherwise, you risk leaving those that perhaps are yeah. out of the job market, age-related, um, behind as well. It's like what you were mentioning, writing and calculating. It is not per se for only the job. It is for your functioning in a society and having fun and having a challenge. Mike, is uh, coming in to the position here in the uh, IT governor's community here in the forum, is there anything further you want to build on from Gavin's points with skills you mentioned earlier? That was a critical I think I think focus. Chuck and, and Gavin pretty much summed it up. I think the most important thing is getting people into the game. <clears throat> I think to the extent that you can't, that people don't understand tech and how they fit in, um, there's a responsibility of both government and businesses. And once again, we need the people to be able to do the work. You know, there's 500,000 open IT jobs in the US. I think there's over 600,000 in the EU. Governments are spending an incredible amount of money on it. Very fragmented in the US. I think the, the EU has done a much better job. I think they put $30 billion uh, together in multiple programs to help with reskilling. But if they're going to do that, where's the content going to come from? And I think the content needs to come from, you know, from business because we're going to build the skills or show the skills that we need to run our companies, not just today, but in the future. And to the extent that we can collaborate on that, work in this private public partnership, I think we have a, we have a win for everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice. Um, I think it is obviously a very, very critical a critical area and probably one of the areas where we've actually got a fairly good leg up in terms of knowing what we might do. Um, and I think there are a lot of other areas that, that aren't quite so far advanced. And maybe I'll turn to Jim sure. to identify. Sure. I, I, well, one thing that strikes me in the conversation here, and I, and I, and I take it from uh, <coughs> Neely's challenge from the business community to get involved, and we sit here as a business community and, and note a skills gap in technology in the business world. And uh, uh, imagine the skills gap mm -hmm. on the regulatory side if we're waiting for that uh, yeah. uh, to be filled as well mm -hmm. to, reg to, to regulate things. So I think we are moving at a pace in which it's going to require a different kind of dialogue to get to a sensible outcome or to, a, to, to, to an improved outcome. Um, I, I would address um, uh, uh, t have two points from the questions on the floor. The first, what would you like to have two years from now? I'd like to have the kind of concrete uh, the kind of concrete outcomes around digital identity, because I think it's foundational, that we've seen out of the IT governors, and I salute uh, Chuck and the team for uh, everything that's gone on in the last two years, to have a concrete proposal and not a white paper, <laughs> you know, that comes out of, the, comes out of that dialogue and, and, and really gives a tool for folks to uh, engage and, 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 and have a solution around the problem. Um, I, I think one other issue that, from the floor, and just for, for what it's worth, I think there was a profound idea put forward, that notion of who owns your personal yeah. digital yeah. data. Um, it, it's something, um, we're living through this fourth industrial revolution. A uh, few of us lived through the prior three, <laughs> right? <laughs> None of us, perhaps. Um, but we, we have seen another phenomenon, which is an incredible concentration of power uh, amongst a handful of companies, and one could argue, perhaps, a greater global concentration of power uh, than in any of the prior uh, industrial revolutions. Um, and, you know, that's something we're going to have to grapple with. And I think um, the company uh, that figures out how to empower people with their own data and to provide radical transparency to that, um, I think is going to be ahead of the game. And, and I think that's going to have to be uh, both a public-private dialogue as to, as, as, to, as to whose rights those are. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. That such a mechanism by which if you use this, then in a transparent way the user knows that if my data is being used in this algorithm, 
which is making you money, I'm getting a few microseconds, <laughs> will benefit. So I think the forum has to look at what are the technologies together and how can we get like, you know, sectors, whether it is universities or other organizations or the open source movement, to come up with a platform which then forces these uh, networks, sort of like, you know, effect companies, to, to, to differentiate themselves by doing it. Uh, but the incentive isn't there for these companies to do it. Fascinating. So, you know, Jim brought up a good point. You know, seven of the top biggest companies right now are all technology companies. If you take a look at the top four, their raw material is data. Right. Go back 100 years. Most important and the largest companies were oil companies. So data is the new oil. If you had a farm in Pennsylvania and they were doing fracking, which is a new technology, you get a check every month because they're accessing something that you own. Eventually, there will be a business model where this oil, which is really data, gets monetized and somehow that has to get back into the hands of the people that own it. There is no business model right now. Similar, there is no business model to help people understand you know, oil 100 years ago. I think that we're going to have to evolve to it, but it's going to happen an awful lot quicker. Yeah, I, I, it took, it took a while in Europe, but we are still ahead, no doubt about that to accept the general regulation, the general data regulation uh, for the protection. And it will be in charge from the 25th of May mm -hmm. yeah. this year. And I would advise everybody take that as a mirror and you can just uh, make it more special or whatever. But that is the base. And by the way, don't think that it is only happening here or in Europe or in the US, uh, that type of discussion. It's also happening in the Far East. It's also happening in mm -hmm. Africa. And there we have to push and we have to find a way, because it's global. Digital technology is global. It's, not, it's borderless, so to say. So if this could be the base, the European uh, regulation, so to say, for uh, general data protection, then we know from each other what is the line? Hmm. Chuck, I think you wanted to come in. Well, I think that uh, your, your comment <coughs> over here about when does a disruptive business model emerge that actually uh, provides some of the benefit back to the, the provider of the data. Hmm. I, I suspect that as technologies like blockchain and others come along, that that will be the disruption of the current business model, right? These business models don't last forever. And, uh, and I think that then what happens is you, you incent the consumer to change their behavior about the, relative to their expectations, and then it's, it, it, it evolves from there. So I, I think that you know, there can certainly be technologies that are a spouse that might incent that. Ultimately, I think business can, some business will bring, come up with a disruptive model that does something similar to that, or some of the existing players will determine that that's the differentiator for them going forward. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think some of that probably happens a, little, a, little, a bit naturally. Um, I think the, um, uh, the, the, the other thing I was going to comment on is this, this issue of uh, security and identity, because I think this is really, really important. First of all, I think the tech companies that participate in security, we're, gonna ha we're, we're having to innovate at a rate that is just off the charts. I mean, we, we actually are blocking, you're getting attacked once every second. We're blocking 20 billion threats every day for our customers. Yeah. 20 billion right, is the number we see. Yeah. And then we have to navigate how do we do that in a world that's, com that's become more encrypted, right, where everything's more encrypted. Mm. And so the innovation is required. Like We just shipped some technology that actually allows you to determine when there's malware inside encrypted traffic without decrypting it to try to split the difference between, you know, between privacy and security. And I think that's... Uh, it's a really complicated issue. And the final thing I'll say on this is around identity. As we think about security going forward, you know, for years we built security around defending a perimeter, right? And the perimeter's gone, obviously, so I'm sure that's news to everybody. But uh, we think of, in this context, we think of identity as the new perimeter that we have to do. That is really where the, the biggest security investments of the future are going to have to land is defining security based on that identity and then go from there. It's, it's a much different approach. So, There's so many interesting topics here. <laughs> it would be really worthwhile of, of, frankly, probably a day 
um, in itself in the discussion. <laughs> We're coming to the last 10 minutes of the hour, though. So I think in terms of, again, um, one of the ob objectives of this session was to try and make it concrete for the Davos Impact Agenda for 2018. So I'd like to go around and ask each one of the panelists quite briefly to say, what have you heard today that you might suggest either becomes a new piece of work for the forum in 2018, or is there something you've heard today that would change the trajectory of work you actually have underway in your various responsibilities here in the forum? So I can sure. um, go first. I think First of all, I'm encouraged and optimistic that we're heading in the right direction. If anything, acceleration. Um, we're not going fast enough to the extent that we can get this public-private partnership, especially on the skills, which I think is very tangible, get that out into the market and show that we're paying attention, that we're not tone deaf. I think, um, I think that's something I'm hearing louder uh, rather than when I got here. Secondly, I do think, and I've been paying attention to this for a while, the concept of data. <laughs> and who owns the data, how is the data monetized, I think that's going to become a much, much more important issue. And that's something we should probably take up on a broader scale at, at Davos. Thank you, Mike. Ili? The point, who owns the data, but then taking into account that you have to protect the data. For otherwise, you are losing the trust and you are really lost for you are not explaining to everybody um, <clears throat> we keep an eye uh, on, on it and it's okay. That's not enough anymore. The trust needs to be transparent, feed it, and um, anyhow uh, give us a, a positive point uh, for, the, uh, for the future, but the future starting today. My point for uh, the World Economic Forum would be please take uh, attention to that point of the social media and the influence on the young, the real young generation. I'm worried about that. We are facing those results when it's too late. Thank you, Neely. Chuck? Um, wow, there's, a, there's so many things. I think the, uh, you know, hopefully we can get more energy around the skilling effort and bring more, more companies together because this platform is not you know, it shouldn't just be 20 tech companies content. It should be, every, it should be a model for how everybody takes things, things forward. I think the uh, three other quick comments, I think, secondly, we have to figure out how to work more effectively between technology and government, right? To really pragmatically talk about these issues. And, and, uh, and I know that's, that's motherhood and apple pie and it's much more complicated <laughs> than that, but uh, I think that's, that's really important. Uh, the third is, I think, at some point we need, and we, we, we looked at this issue two years ago and people were scared to tackle it, just to be transparent. Uh, in our, and and it, was, uh, it was around taking a more active role in the discussion around data privacy and cross-border data flows and how, how that should happen on a global basis as opposed to letting everybody, I mean, it's not letting everybody, every country has the right to do their, what they'd like to do, but I think if there's some sort of standards that, that become <laughs> agreed upon, then it certainly facilitates things and can help us actually increase access, drive skill a lot more effectively than we do today. And then Neely, just a final comment on your comment about children and these devices. Parents around the world need to stand up and be parents and not friends. And for some reason, we've gotten into this mode as parents that we want to be friends. And uh, I think it's, it's horrendous what we allow our children to do in general, much less how long we give them on these digital devices. Thank you, Chuck. Kevin? Uh, it's, the, it's the skills agenda for me. Um, I mean, we've, we've all touched on it today. Uh, I think it, it, it cuts, uh, cuts across many different aspects of the forum's work, but ensuring that tech is built into primary school curricula around the world is key. I think seeing, uh, ensuring that tech is seen as a, uh, as a way of you know, creating more social mobility, uh, more inclusiveness uh, around the world, that people embrace things like uh, AI uh, and, see, and, and see it as a, as a powerful way of solving the world's problems rather than a threat to their livelihood. You know, so you know, I think <coughs> educating people on the, the, the potential of technology, providing them with the, 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 the skills and, 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 and the opportunity for self-development to ensure that they can take advantage of that. Uh, and, uh, and so you know, we, we truly are able to realize 
the, the potential of what we have in front of us because I think we've just started. <laughs> Am I allowed to add one line to that? <clears throat> I'm absolutely certain that the present cultural system of the labor market doesn't function and doesn't match the needs of the people and doesn't match the, uh, the need of the industry. If you are above 45, you can be the expert, you can be a whisket, name it in the digital technology. You don't get a job. So we have to change our, our mindset. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nui. Jim? Sure, I'll take from this conversation today a little bit of a nuance around where we put our priorities in our, in our dialogues uh, with the system initiative um, to focus more on this notion of ownership of personal data. Um, and not just the kind of this notions of privacy as the right to be forgotten, but this notion of the right to share in the uh, riches that come from, uh, you know, a, a, the use of your personal information. And um, I think that's a really important concept I think it's also at the f part of the foundation of, of of creating that trustworthy environment where mm -hmm. and, and 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 having a trusted um, uh, 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 interaction digitally um, uh, has so much potential to build trust generally, but at the moment, uh, one could argue it's actually strengthening the divide or widening the divide. So I think it's really important. I think that's very good. I think we've come up to the, the last few minutes here, and we've certainly had a lot of discussion on, on data and identity and on trust and various, um, certainly on skills, um, hit upon a number of the issues that we actually see globally um, in the economy. The one thing I think we haven't touched upon that would help tie a lot of those together is really how do we actually, we talk about new types of partnerships or competitive partnerships or private-public partnerships. We talk about trust. But we, we haven't actually talked about how we actually engage the citizens more broadly. You know, this panel is industry and a policy maker, and yet we talk about the digital economy, the people that are frankly, developing key pieces of that digital economy and certainly much impacted by it, don't have the same opportunity to have a voice in a lot of these discussions and are significantly impacted. If we take identity, which is something that's very important, not only here in the forum, but generally, when identity is set, it's permanent. It's with you for life, whether you change to a different system or not. And there are a lot of positives, a lot of pluses. There are a tremendous amount of downsides as well. So to have that discussion, um, I think we need to find ways to do that in a much more open, um, much more inclusive environment. And the WEF actually has, through the Digital Economy and Society, a set of activities on network platforms. And part of that's being done out of the San Francisco Center um, for the Fourth Industrial Revolution as well. And, and I know they're looking at agile governance. And, but I think it's really critical that we move that up the priority list and away from some of the topics. So if we want answers to some of these things, whether it's security, or it's use of social media, or we need to find a way to engage much more broadly um, across the, the world. So I think that's one of the things I would take away in, in my work here at the forum. I think try and find a way to, to advance that. Um, with that, I think we've come to the end, as I'm being signaled. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists very, very much um, for a very, very interesting discussion and for the excellent questions here from the audience as well. And as this is the very first session, very first morning of the first day at Davos, I'm sure these conversations will continue to resonate for the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.